And we do have six uh, in attendance. And I wanted to note that just real quickly that um, our, our two council members are in um, a council meeting, which is an extension of Monday's meeting. So um, I think that we should not wait on them. They might be there a long time. We don't know. <laughs> oh, everyone got panicky phone calls and emails and voice messages from me <laughs> stating as much. So, yep. <laughs> Right. Wonderful. Well, good evening, and we'll call the meeting to order. Um, we do have a quorum. Uh, Jessica, do I have you call the roll? I always forget this. Do I have you call the roll first and then the motion to meet virtually or virtually first? Virtually first, please. All right. Wonderful. I need a motion to, to suspend the rules and meet virtually. That's so moved. Thank you, Kathy. And I need a second. Second. All right, Jessica, can you run through the roll? Okay, thank you. Uh, Charles Fry. Um, <gasps> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Ohanian. Uh, yes. Okay. Demita Cravens. Here. Okay. Sheree Lackey. Yes. Amanda Ngola? Yes. Archna Stud? Yes. And Kathy Hayes? Yes. Great, thank you. Wonderful, working through the agenda now. I need an approval of meeting minutes from April 14, 2022. We've all had time to review the minutes. Do I have a motion for approval? Motion to approve the April meeting minutes. Thank you, Derek. I will need a second. Second. Thank you, Kathy. With that, Jessica, can you run through the roll? If you said Cheryl's Fry, my vote is yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Ohanian? Yes. Demita Cravens? Thank you. Sheree Lackey? Yes. Amanda Ngola? Yes. Archna Sood? Yes. And Kathy Hayes? Yes. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. We are going to ask uh, for our first portion of public comment. Um, we will have public comment again later in the meeting, but I will pause here to see if there are any in the audience that would like to provide public comment prior to our presentations this, after, uh, this evening. All right. And with that, we'll go to the next item, which is our presentations. And the, uh, this, I believe we're handing it over to, to Kristen. Is that correct? Wonderful. All right, Kristen, take it away. Okay, great. And I'm going to share my screen here. And we can see your screen. Thank you for confirming. Um, and so I'm Kristen Meyer, the Community Health Specialist for the Evanston Health Department. Um, and I've been working for the past 18 months on um, a comprehensive and systematic um, community health assessment. Um, we do this every five years um, as the health department um, to really um, create a, a full understanding of what health and well being looks like in Evanston um, to identify our our most pressing health priorities and to create a plan for um, addressing those priorities and acting on them. Um, unsurprisingly to probably everyone on this call, mental health arose as um, a, you know, in the top three priorities um, as a community health need in Evanston. And so um, the assessment that I've done um, covers a wide range of health, um, social, and economic outcomes and how they kind of vary across different subpopulations in Evanston. But I'm going to focus on um, our findings around mental health, both um, some quantitative findings and also um, kind of what we're hearing from our community members. 
Um, so starting with data, just kind of trend data on um, people who are reporting frequent mental distress. So um, this is a question um, that was asked in a representative sample um, each year from 2014 to 2019 um, has, you know, continued to be asked. We just have data um, going up to 2019 so far. Um, the, and the question was, um, in the last 30 days, um, did you have at least two weeks of poor mental health? Um, and so you can see the, the percentage that responded um, that they did experience more um, days of poor mental health in the previous month than good mental health. Um, and you can see, you know, we kind of have a trend um, where we're slowly but steadily um, rising in reports of mental distress um, in Evanston. Again, um, you know, just to note, these are pre-pandemic numbers. And so we can expect, you know, that um, with the, the huge impact that the pandemic has had on all of our kind of mental well-being that um, when the, the numbers are released for 2020 through 2022 that, that we might see significant jumps here. Um, we can also look at this data in a little bit more of a granular way. So um, this is looking at in 2019 um, for Evanston by neighborhood um, who was reporting frequent mental distress. Um, and so again, in, in Evanston, that was about 11% um, of adults. Um, so slightly lower than the state. Um, so across Illinois, adults, 12% of adults reported frequent mental distress. Um, but then we see um, kind of a lot of geographic variety um, by neighborhood. And so just to kind of take a look at this um, map of different outcomes. These um, different shaded areas are um, census tracts of Evanston, and that's just the way that the government kind of breaks Evanston into chunks to be able to understand um, different things at a neighborhood level. Um, and so um, the darker blue, the area, the higher the burden of poor mental health, reported poor mental health um, in that tract. And so um, we see that the highest report of poor mental health was actually 15.8% um, right here. Um, uh, this is the kind of the uh, census tract encompassing the Northwestern campus. Um, and then the second highest report of poor mental health was right here, 14.5%. And this census tract um, corresponds really closely with the fifth ward um, and with our most economically distressed um, neighborhood in Evanston. Um, so we can see that um, while you know, on average, we have about 11% of adults reporting poor mental health. Um, in some neighborhoods, that's much lower. And then um, in, in some neighborhoods, much higher. So I think these, um, these areas where uh, mental distress reporting is high, um, we, we might um, kind of correlate that with high levels of economic distress in that fifth ward area, because we know that that is very closely tied to mental well, mental and emotional well-being and mental distress. And then in the Northwestern area, you know, that might reflect, um, you know, really high um, burden of uh, stress and, um, you know, mental health issues among our adolescent and young adult population, which is something that we're um, hearing a lot about nationally and in Evanston. Okay, and now I've got some data that's um, all about kind of hospitalization. So um, this is the rate of emergency room mood disorder visits. So those are things like um, being um, admitted to the emergency room um, for things like bipolar or major depressive disorders. Um, and this is the rate per 10,000 people. Um, here we've got um, the Illinois rate um, by race, ethnicity, um, so broken down by white, black, and Hispanic, Latino. Um, and we can see even, 
you know, in the state overall that we see um, a, a kind of significant racial disparity wherein we have um, more black residents um, going to the emergency room. Um, there, there may be a lot behind these numbers, but I think one thing that this could really indicate is, you know, we all know that um, the emergency room is not the best place to treat mental health. Um, if you end up in the emergency room, that might indicate a lack of um, access to preventative care. That might, um, you know, when you're in a crisis, uh, the emergency room is is not a place that's ideal to de-escalate. And so I think that we can really interpret this as um, kind of, you know, when we see these, these higher rates of racial inequity, that this might reflect a lack of access to care. Um, and so in Illinois, we already have this kind of pretty stark racial inequity. Um, but then when we look at Evanston's number specifically, breaking that down both by race and by zip code, we can see um, that that racial disparity that we see between whites and blacks in Illinois um, is magnified quite a bit um, here locally in Evanston. So in Evanston, um, our black residents in specifically the zip code 60201, so kind of northern half of Evanston, have an ER visit rate for mood disorders seven times higher than white Evanstonians. Um, so again, really probably reflecting um, a, a lack of access to better care. Um, we can look also at um, emergency room um, visits for alcohol-related disorders. Um, and, you know, what's interesting here is that statistically speaking, um, when we, we look at drinking behaviors um, by race, we tend to see much um, lower reporting of binge drinking among Black individuals across the country um, than we do among white individuals. But um, when we look at our emergency room um, visits for alcohol disorders, um, we again see this racial disparity wherein um, Black folks are visiting the emergency room at a higher rate. And again, in Evanston, that um, inequity is um, is much higher even than that state rate. Um, and so um, this white or the um, black ED visit rate for 60201 is six, six times higher than um, the rate that white Evanstonians are going to the emergency room um, for alcohol related disorders. Again, you know, it might reflect an access to care, might reflect kind of, um, you know, I wonder what role over policing has um, in this data. Um, and that's kind of the limitation of some of this quantitative data is we can we can ask some of those questions, but it's hard to know everything that's kind of going on behind these numbers. Um, and then getting into um, the community input. And so um, there were a variety of ways that we sought um, words from the, the community members about, um, you know, what mattered to them in terms of health and well being. Um, and so one way was through um, a specific mental health focused town hall um, that was held with about 35 um, low-income Black and Latinx parents across Evanston, mostly parents of um, elementary age children. Um, and they ident identified a couple key barriers to mental health. Um, and the, the one that was mentioned time and time again is just this critical shortage of therapists, particularly for um, folks in poverty um, who, who are either uninsured or have um, you know, low quality insurance that just doesn't cover mental health in the same way. Um, and so really identified a need for a lot um, higher quantity of um, free, low cost and, and Medicaid um, therapists and, and mental health providers. And also um, another really critical need um, is that that care be delivered by, um, you know, someone who's culturally competent. So, um, you know, it's been really hard um, in this shortage of therapists to find um, providers that 
um, reflect the community that that you know needs to be served. So we need more um, access to Black and Brown therapists, um, queer and trans therapists, Spanish speaking therapists, and also just generally bilingual therapists. Um, specifically, one thing that was identified is really therapists that understand kind of some of the issues around. Um, trauma around immigration and, and the way that that kind of affects family dynamics. Um, and so, you know, again, not surprising to anyone, this kind of lack of access to preventative care has really resulted in just problems exacerbating and, and reaching a crisis level. Um, and so I have this quote here from a mother that says, if you have Medicaid or cheap insurance, you won't have access to services quickly. I have a daughter with a mental health condition. She was hospitalized a few times. We had to wait two months for a therapist and then she missed her appointment because she was hospitalized and had to start with a new therapist and wait another two months because she missed her appointment. So again, just one kind of anecdote that really reflects um, this very problematic gap in services that then leads to um, people having to seek much higher levels of care and then kind of start the, the process all over again when they miss that um, preventative care visit. Um, and of course, um, you know, when you restart with a brand new therapist, you're having to build trust again and kind of restart um, you know, that, that process of, of healing. And so um, it really reflects kind of the, um, the really acute issue that we're seeing with um, just the lack of providers right now. Another um, issue that um, residents raised was just a, in general, kind of a lack of opportunities for youth right now, especially, um, you know, lack of affordable um, opportunities. One thing is um, there was a lot of discussion about, um, you know, the, the for children with mental health conditions, the services and support that was available to them in schools. Um, so um, both um, kind of social workers, therapists, um, those services are very lacking and also just kind of the understanding and being able to work um, with families who um, whose children are experiencing mental health conditions um, was seen as a, a real area that needs growth um, in our schools. And then, um, and then just in general, safe places for children um, to, to play and grow and, and, and be adolescents. And so um, there was a lot of talk about how, um, you know, what, what used to be kind of, you know, places where youth could gather the mall or things like that, those spaces are, are kind of drying up. And now um, if youth gather in the park, you know, you might have fear of kind of, you know, the police being called or that not being safe. And um, all of the social outlets, healthy outlets for youth right now cost money like camps and sports and um, are just unaffordable for families right now. And so really talking about kind of the lack of safe spaces um, that leads to you know, youth either being placed in dangerous situations or just being isolated at home after they've been isolated for multiple years with the pandemic and that really taking a toll on mental well-being. We also talked to providers. Um, so the Mental Health Task Force is a group of um, therapists and other mental health experts um, who serve uh, Evanston residents. And so they um, identified um, some areas of critical need um, that they see from, from their perspective um, and developed some recommendations. Um, one is investing in um, a community navigator to really um, help community members find services because it's practically a full-time job to find a therapist, particularly one um, that is free or sliding scale. Um, and so we really need someone who can help folks navigate the system efficiently and get the care that they need quickly so that we don't see these, um, you know, exacerbations to crisis level where kids are ending up, um, you know, in the hospital. 
Another thing is reinforcing crisis infrastructure. So um, definitely um, the investments in um, the living room, I think are gonna be great, um, but you know, anything we can do around kind of mobile crisis response, they recommend it as being a key part of addressing this issue. And then um, just like we heard from community residents, we really need to expand our um, local care capacity. So making sure that there's more access to um, therapists, free and low cost therapists, and also just speaking to kind of the care capacity that um, we also acknowledge that um, you know, mental health relates so much to um, to economic distress and to experience of racism and other types of discrimination. And so that we really need to um, have wraparound services um, and address the needs of the whole family unit to really um, be able to address mental health um, for an individual. And then um, you may be familiar with the series of ARPA roundtables that were done um, last year. Um, and so um, ARPA, for those who might not know, um, it is a uh, you know funding that Evanston qualifies for um, due to our pandemic response. So the city has $43 million um, that we need to decide how to allocate allocate um, to um, recover from the pandemic. And so the Evanston Community Foundation um, uh, conducted a series of roundtable conversations across the community with a lot of different sectors, some focusing on seniors, some folks with disabilities, some early childhood, um, and, and really tried to kind of systematically um, assess what different subpopulations were identifying as critical needs for um, kind of coming back and building back better um, post pandemic. And so in six out of eight of these conversations, mental health arose as the top priority, which I think is really telling. Um, and specifically, when folks were talking about what was needed, it was this access to affordable and culturally competent, um, culturally reflective um, mental health services that is, is both kind of um, a long held um, unmet need for, for many years, but then also is particularly um, urgent um, in the wake of the pandemic. And then so, um, so a lot of this data led to the health department adopting um, mental health as um, a key priority for us to address in the next five years. And so just kind of going over the, the overarching kind of conclusions of some of this data, um, one is that mental health is, is absolutely one of our most critical needs in this community and one of our mo most urgent inequities that we really need to address, um, both um, you know, racially and socioeconomically. Um, we saw in the pre-pandemic data you know, that there was already a growing burden of, of mental distress across our community and that certainly as um, numbers come out um, we expect that to, to, to jump a lot, unfortunately. Um, as, as I'm sure we all know, you know, there's just such a lack of, you know, mental health infrastructure nas nationally um, that, you know, there is no easy way out of this problem locally um, where we're, we're kind of led to rely on a patchwork of systems policing the emergency room um, and and neither of those systems are designed to address kind of the root causes of this issue and so we need to think kind of beyond those things um you know as as residents and providers brought up there's an increasing shortage of um, providers for our most vulnerable community members and there's a lot of community consensus around this need um, to, to find ways to provide um, mental health care for those um, most vulnerable community members. Um, and so um, addressing mental health in Evanston is, is, you know, is, is going to be a two-part kind of strategy. One is, you know, building and investing in that local infrastructure and um, care provision, but also acknowledging kind of the root causes of 
trauma coming from housing insecurity, poverty, racism, exposure to violence, um, and really um, encapsulating that in our um, action plan as well. Um, and so I just want to touch on um, kind of as we're thinking about how um, we measure our, you know, progress around mental health um, as we, um, you know, enact this plan. It unfortunately really is challenging. Um, it's going to be a challenging thing to measure, um, at least quantitatively. Um, and just a couple of reasons why, you know, as as I've shared, there is this lag time in data reporting at both the state and national level. And so it's hard to track in real time um, the impact that we're having on mental health. Also, you know, when we um, when this group makes a, a decision on on, you know, what programs or um, initiatives to support, it's hard to say, um, it's hard to isolate that investment and say that that caused um, an increase in or a decrease in mental distress or that, um, you know, if we continue to see increasing mental distress that um, that what we try didn't work. It, it's just um, it's just a lot. It's very difficult to establish that kind of causal mechanism. And then, um, you know, it's it's just very, very expensive to uh, accurately collect that data at the local level. So I think the 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 best way that we can really um, track this for now is looking at who is being served and making sure that that reflects what we know in the data about um, where our inequities really lie. Um, and then, um, you know, collecting a combination of both qualitative and quantitative data um, and kind of doing the best we can to assess over time, um, you know, how we're doing uh, in our mental health response. Um, but certainly, I think the data reflects that this is an urgent priority that um, that cannot be, you know, cannot wait to be acted on. Um, and then, so again, I'm Kristen Meyer. If anybody has any further questions about the data or would like to see more, here's my email address and I'd be happy to, to share um, additional resources with you all. Thank you so much, Kristen. Of course. And I will start by first just seeing if any committee members have any questions for Kristen. If you do, oh, perfect. There we go, Kathy. <laughs> it's me again. Hi, Kristen. Thank you for the report. Um, we kind of knew that that was the case, but it was great to see. Um, you referred, you made um, reference to an action plan. What is the action plan on the ground looking like? And what is the time element for this action plan by the Yeah. yeah. Great question. Um, that action plan is currently in development um, and our timeline is um, kind of uh, through July to um, create it, um, but it will be an iterative process as we go on. And um, what we're doing right now as we, you know, after we've identified that mental health is the priority is that we need to talk to, um, we need to go back to all those community members and community leaders and really see what what needs to be highlighted in this action plan. So, you know, talking to you, for example, um, can, can help inform um, what gets um, highlighted within, within that action plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and Derek. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for that presentation. Obviously not surprising data, but still upsetting and shocking to see nonetheless, um, especially when it's quantified like that. I was curious in, in any of the work that you and your team did, did you happen to compare uh, to data in comparable cities like, I don't know, Ann Arbor, Berkeley, um, analogs to Evanston and see how, uh, what, what their trends were? Oh, that's interesting. You know, I, um, so I, I can say that for example, the um, kind of slow and steady increase in, in um, reports of mental distress really reflects what we're seeing nationally. Um, but but one thing I've looked into a little bit, and I, I can't 
say anything at the moment um, about mental health specifically is um, I've also kind of looked at how Skokie is doing on a lot of the health metrics that um, I've collected for Evanston just because, you know, it is a nearby community um, that's, you know, similar in size. Um, and, you know, I have to say that they, um, on a lot of fronts, they're, they're doing better equity wise than Evanston. Um, I, I can't uh, speak specifically to mental health at, at this moment. I could certainly get you that data. Um, but that's, that's something that um, we, we are seeing is that, you know, and not only in our mental health data, but kind of across the board, we've really got, um, you know, some profound equity issues um, in our city to work through that, that are more drastic than our neighboring communities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kristen. Of course. Um, Amanda, you had your hand up. Was your question also the Kathy question? That was also my question. Yeah, I think my question is answered. So thank you. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, let me see. I moved away, unfortunately, from my agenda. And are we just moving into continuing staff reporting and handing it back to Jessica? So, so we can, if, if I could say, I'm sorry, I'm trying to navigate my raise hand, lower hand button. It's quite challenging. Um, Derek, to, to address your point, um, there, there is an organization called uh, Mental Health America that does look at states overall. Um, and, and I did have more information about that um, that, that we may or may not get to in this meeting that, that we, you know, I may or may not scrap depending on time. Um, but, but I would be happy to either present more or perhaps have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. I agree that looking at things at a more local level, um, is critical, but, but the, the sort of bigger sort of national or state by state pictures are out there. If, if the committee had the appetite to take that on. Um, but, but moving on in our agenda, we have another presentation. Uh, Jeremy McCray is with us from our Youth and Young Adult Division. I, I will let him introduce himself, but he is our, our next person. So, so if there aren't any other further questions, I will pass it over to him, actually. Hello, hello. How's everyone doing? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you guys. Uh, my name is Jeremy McCray. I work for the City of Evanston. I manage the Youth and Young Adult Outreach Division for the City of Evanston. And uh, I just want to give you, give you guys kind of a brief uh, overview of what will take place with the youth that we frequently and often deal with. And uh, just kind of touch basis with you and lay out an extensive plan that we are planning to lay out for the youth and young adults for this summer. So I'll start by saying, uh, okay, so we are currently gearing up for the summer. Uh, the summer presents a unique set of challenges for our youth, and our goal is to make the summer as fun and safe as possible for all currently, uh, for our current youth and youth that are participating in our programs. We are working to execute the following. Uh, so with this plan that we're putting in place, we kind of, we kind of teamed up with uh, nine other organizations, uh, the collective informed of a collective group, which consists of the Moran Center, uh, the city of Evanston, uh, YJC, YOU, Peer Services, uh, Connections for Homeless, and one more, uh, uh, the YWCA. Uh, when the shooting took place in 2021, uh, we wanted to kind of create more of a, a wraparound support for the youth and kind of kind of get more in the thick of things. So we created an initiative called My City, Our City, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit, but I just wanted to give you guys some context of why the initiative was created. We felt that we needed some immediate attention to the youth and we wanted to give them something to uh, kind of keep the time going and uh, keep their schedule idle for the uh, summer. Uh, so the Mayor's Summer Youth Employment Job Fair will start on June 6th. Uh, we currently had 734 youth attend the job fair. It was on March 12th. Uh, we are currently looking to place about three to about 350 
of those 700 youth will be placed in jobs this summer and they'll start working on June 6th. The program will be a nine week program that'll go from June 6th all the way until August 5th. Uh, for the first time, the youth will be required to participate in a job orientation, which will uh, include a training regarding sexual harassment and healthy relationships training. Uh, we created this training because we thought it would be perfect to, to kind of get the youth uh, ahead of schedule with uh, learning and understanding what it means to uh, be in situations that are not healthy, uh, grooming positions, and just unhealthy relationships. Uh, we think that it was pivotal for every youth that participates in MSYP, which is known as the Mayor Summer Youth Employment Program. I'm sorry you'll hear me say MSYP a lot because that's what I usually call it, but it's actually the Mayor Summer Youth Employment Program. So every youth will participate in that training uh, and it'll be some of the most at risk and opportunity youth that'll be also participating. So we'll get a real good uh, sense of uh, where we at with some of the youth and you know if, if we need to uh, lend an extra hand on some of those trainings. Uh, we are also uh, bringing together something called virtual MSYP. We actually started this during the pandemic where youth who were not able to actually work in person, we would create something online for them to do. And with this virtual, it's kind of more of a life skills. They meet twice a week uh, after summer school. So kids who are not able to get a job because of summer school, they still able to get virtual, uh, virtual MSYP, which is the Mayor Summer Youth Employment Program. Uh, so virtual will begin on 6-7 and youth who are able to obtain an in-person, youth who are not able to obtain an uh, in-person summer job will be able to make under $500 for the summer. So, so if a youth did not get a job or a uh, youth is not looking to work because maybe because of COVID or maybe or anything else, they are able to sign up for this virtual MSYP. Any youth that's in Evanston that does not have a job or looking to have a job can sign up for a virtual. This will go live Monday. Uh, and it'll be posted on our city website for any youth that, again, that's in Evanston will be allowed to do this. Uh, it will Classes will consist of financial literacy, workplace uh, components, building a resume, interviewing skills, and so on and so forth. Just them learning the basic skills of how to get prepared for a job and what some of the things that uh, matter while you're in a job. Uh, we're going to teach them about financial literacy. We also do a Know Your Rights training where we bring a police officer and either an alderman or someone who's really kind of permanent to what's going on in the community. They kind of go through of a, a logistics of things of how to comport yourself if a youth gets stopped by the police, how to interact with a police officer, what questions to ask, what questions not to ask, and just kind of giving them a basic overview of how to protect yourself and how to just be prepared for everything. So virtual uh will will kick off six seven and it'll kick off a day after msyp i think that with both of these uh kind of things running side by side it should kind of have a lot of the youth in evanston uh, kind of occupied for a long time so i think that's our goal to uh have the kids working and uh continuously doing something for the whole entire summer uh speaking about uh my city our city uh, initiative that we started uh with the collective uh, it's a safe summer initiative that will begin this year with the violence prevention week this is something new that we're doing this year and we're actually in partnering with this is 65 and 202 so the week of the last week of school when the kids get out at 65 which is 523 through 527 we are going to install uh, a, 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 a violence prevention week that'll take place from here on out from next year on to so from 523 every time you get to every time you get out of school uh, that week will be a violence prevention week. Uh, Mayor Biss will proclaim this week as violence prevention week and 6-3 will be in, in six and on 6-3 uh, there will be uh, it will be declared uh, gun violence prevention day. Uh, if you are able to please join us at Mason Park on 6-3 in our first uh, Friday event and if you can wear orange it'll be a big uh, crowd out there and we'll kick off our My City initiative with a huge uh, barbecue and uh, uh, gaming and uh, free activities for everybody in the uh, Everston community. Uh, Known that the orange symbolized the color that uh, hunters wear to make others hunters know that human life is present and precious and not uh, not so much to shoot. We will have a movie in the park that day. Uh, it'll be free food, it'll be giveaways, obstacle courses will be outside, many community partners and many community valuable members would be in attendance. So I would love to see you guys if you can be a part of that. Uh, it'll be a a huge thing for Evanston, and we have first Fridays, the first of every month. So there'll be one in June, July, and August. It'll be all through the duration of the summer. 
All First Friday events are held at Mason Park, and they'll be from 6 o'clock to 9 p.m. at night on Fridays. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there will be an open house and ribbon cutting ceremony for Gibbs Morrison Center. So uh, we, on May 24th, we are opening up a teen center uh, for the high school students that participate uh, at the high school, and they will be they will be allowed to come inside Gibbs Morrison to run it as a teen center. Uh, if you can, again, we'll obviously do a ribbon cutting. If you if you guys are available, I think that it would be good to see uh, some of you faces in the community and just you know giving us some extra additional support with us opening up this teen center, which would be a, a not really a huge challenge, but it'll be some adjustment. Uh, it, it is on Church and Dodge. Gibbs Morrison is located on Church and Dodge. It's Kitty Corner from the high school. So uh, I assume that we'll see a lot of activities uh, there and I believe it'll be great activities. Uh, we have redid Gibbs Morrison. We've added new furniture inside. We've added new TVs inside. We added new, we pretty much reshaped it to it for it to look like an actual teen center. So uh, it would be good for you guys to come by and see it. The hours for the teen center, uh, once the summer begins, uh, we'll go again from, uh, for for summer hours, we'll go from uh, five to nine. Most of those youth will be working, so we don't. Right now, we're not opposed to open it a little bit earlier, but hopefully, we have as many youth as possible working, so that when they get off work, they'll be able to come to uh, the teen center to enjoy and then get back ready for work. Uh, as a part of my city initiative, we will uh, assist block clubs also into and in executing their block parties and efforts to ensure that there are more. Uh, activities for the summer and that you have something to do that's productive and meaningful. Uh, our first block party will be held uh, June 4th uh, on Hovland. Uh, again, I talked about uh, the collective getting together and us forming a uh, My City, Our City kind of initiative. It actually stems from the shooting that took place in 2021 uh, on Hovland. So we thought that every year we would kick off uh, our initiative with the block party at Hovland. Uh, it'll be on the 4th. It'll be from I believe from one to seven, uh, it will be obviously a, a, a fun filled event. Everything will be free uh, and we'll be out there to celebrate uh, some great things and, and make sure that the community know that we're moving in peace and uh, we're trying to make sure that it's a successful summer. Uh, in addition to that, Robert Crown and Fleet will be open in specific nights from six to nine so that youth have some place to go uh, and surrounded by caring adults providing uh, opportunities for them educational wise activities and uh, just being there for them and figuring out how we can help them on a day to day basis. Uh, Robert Crown has been an interesting uh, place where the youth actually love to come now. Uh, it, it did not used to be that way, uh, as we all probably know on this call, but we have turned Robert Crown into that space and they love it. They enjoy it. They are skating. I'm actually here right now. They're here skating, uh, playing basketball. They really love this space. So we're going to continue to keep it up. Uh, so that they can enjoy it. But uh, we're using uh, Robert Crown as more of a, a drop-in center for the middle school youth, and then Gibbs Morrison to be a drop-in center for more of the high school youth. We're trying to figure out a way to separate that age group because we don't want any trouble to arise by that. Uh, we've been successful in doing that, uh, and we are ready to keep these young people busy. Uh, we're ready to get them some jobs. We're ready to just say, just figure out whatever they need and meet them at the level uh, that's needed. Uh, I have a team of not or eight going on nine. Uh, six of them are four time outreach workers. Uh, one of them is part time and then we have some youth advocates. I have a tremendous team uh, that, and I just want to name them just so you guys notice if you ever run into the, if you ever run into them in the community, you would know that they're part of the youth and young adult outreach team. Uh, the first one is Stacy Moraney. Uh, Stacy has been with us for a very long time, has a very, very good rapport in the community uh, with the youth and parents. And then we have Lakeisha Barton. Uh, she has been here, obviously, she has been here for about seven years. Uh, Lakeisha is kind of our guru for housing, uh, dealing with youth. She's done a lot of, she's worked with youth her whole entire life. She ran programming out of North, out of, uh, Northwestern and family focused. She, she's a very good asset for us. And then we have uh, Gennaro Hernandez, who's bilingual. Uh, he's Hispanic. Uh, he's been with us for about two years now. Uh, fantastic. He's born and raised in Evanston, as well as Lakeisha and Stacy. Uh, so they have good Evanston ties, uh, and there. And that's and and I think that's the key to building those relationships that we have with the community and the kids. Uh, I think that that's been a, a a huge key of just being able to understand what how Evanston functions and 
how it operates. And then we have Yazari Gutierrez, who's also bilingual, uh, who actually just became full time with us. And uh, she's been tremendous. She's more of our uh, person that gets us, uh, gets us going and keeps us on track. Uh, we also have a guy uh, by the name of Monday. His name is Monday. I know it sounds like it's not, but his name is Monday Bamboos. He works with us. He's a youth advocate. And then we hired uh, Xavier Hiriard, who's also a youth advocate. And we also have someone on this call who's just been uh, hired by us uh, with Demita. Uh, she's also our outreach worker. She just actually got hired for us. She started for us this week. So I'm eager and happy. Uh, for Demita to join our team. Uh, I'm excited. She has already uh, brought some good things to us. Uh, so I'm excited about that. It was good that I know that she would be on this call because I wanted to give her a shout out and just let her know that she's been uh, been amazing for us from the start. Uh, and then, yeah, we're just we're just trying to just make sure that we are in high gear. Uh, Audrey Thompson is our uh, director. Uh, so she has been helping us out through this whole process. Uh, we are busy and things are, things has been a whirlwind for us, but we're getting it under control. Uh, we're figuring out the best, the best ways to serve the youth. Uh, we are looking for more individuals. So uh, if you know any individuals that are interested in working with youth and would love to work with youth, please refer them to the youth division. Uh, if they are interested, we're looking for more important people that really want to help push our mission uh, forward. But yeah, we are here on the ground. Uh, we are in the schools. We heard life skill groups inside the schools. Uh, Tuesday through Fridays, we're at Haven on Tuesdays. Wednesday, we're at Nichols. Thursday, we're at King Lab. And Friday, we're at Chute. So we are trying our best to uh, meet the youth uh, wherever, wherever it's needed. Uh, we've been pretty successful. Uh, we know it's a unique time right now with everything is going on with the summer. But we are uh, uh, shaping into that. And we hope that uh, this kind of comprehensive uh, plan that we're laying out. And we have some more stuff, but this is more of the uh, the stuff that I think that uh, the youth are really uh, get connected to. Uh, we averaged about 300 people at our first Fridays last year. Uh, I think we may average a little bit more than that this year with it being the first year last year, but we're excited, uh, we're happy, and uh, I hope that helps and uh to let you guys know what, what we'll be doing this summer and uh, how we'll be connecting and engaging with the youth. Thank you so much. And if I, if my memory serves me correct, I believe that your programming has earned some recognition um, for its use of data and really reflecting the needs of the community and altering sort of the work that you are doing and the programs offered based off of um, what what the youth wants and um, I believe some national recognition. Yes, ma'am. So we did get some national recognition and it was um, and, and I and I can sit up here and act like it was us. It was not. It was the youth. The youth came up with a lot of this stuff. We had conversations with them. We were holding town hall meetings. They were telling us and directing us and letting us know we had some good insight. But I would I would say that you've had a, a huge part of that of that of that national award. But yes, we did. Wonderful. I think I mean at minimum you took the time to listen, yeah, um, and and to engage them, and uh, it's really amazing. Um, yeah. So, congrats. Um, and with that, I just want to pause and see if there are questions from the committee members. We are a chatty bunch, so the fact that we have no questions um, really explains how thorough you were today, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. And I hope I didn't miss nothing. I don't think I did. Jessica, I know we talk often. Do you think I missed something, <laughs> Jessica? Did I miss anything? I know we had some means, but I think that that, I think I got as much as possible what we will be doing for the youth this summer. I have to say, you nailed it. It was a wonderful presentation. I wanted to take a minute just to, to thank Kristen. Um, she was is my communications link between um, North Shore University Health Systems and the Mental Health Task Force. So without her, uh, I would not have all of the information that you, you guys received in your memo. And I absolutely want to thank you, Jeremy. You you both did an amazing job, but when Jeremy was, was mentioning his team uh, and all of the initiatives that, that they have going on. What I noticed he didn't mention is that he was 
very recently promoted to manager of that team uh, in December of 2021. So you have done an incredible amount of work in an incredibly short period of time. Um, and while I know it's, it's all team, um, these initiatives would not be possible without you steering the ship. So kudos, kudos. Thank you, Jessica. I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, no, thank you. I just wanted to encourage people to go to some of the summer events. They are amazing. And it is exactly what we need to not isolate those youth and those communities from the rest of the community. Actually, it was, it was the first, first Friday um, last summer at Mason Park, and we were all just, oh my God, we haven't had this many people in one place forever. And uh, it, was, it was amazing, and they all were amazing. And the, the youth work to help put those things on they don't just come and enjoy. They are working. They are, they are serving their community. The Foster Senior Club was sitting at a bunch of tables and young people were helping bring them their food and their, I mean, it just, it was, it's some of the most, it's just really wonderful to see people building those relationships and, and, and sharing time together and and really getting to know each other because that's what we really need kudos to the whole team so you made me i'm, I'm sorry guys you made me think about something too so I, I, and i don't want to miss this i think it's huge too so we also have brought together we are on so monday through friday uh we're bringing back the outside mason park basketball league uh mondays and wednesdays will be middle school co-ed girls and boys fridays will be high school co-eds and boys and then and then Tuesday will be just a Tuesday and Thursday will be strictly just a young woman's lead uh, for middle school kids. So we're 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 adding that component to we know a lot of our youth love to play basketball and we're going to bring some things together. It's going to be music out there. We're going to play some of the games on the first Friday. So I think that that's uh, that's huge, too. So if you know any youth or you run across any youth that are looking to play basketball in high school or middle school, please refer them to us and refer them to that. Uh, the league will go from June uh, until they go back to school. So I think that that's another thing that I'll have the kids and the youth, I should say, out of uh, time idle. So please refer them if you know anyone. Absolutely, and Amanda. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I just wondered what um, what is the age range of the youth that you work with? Is it mostly middle and high school? Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. So, and, and, and I was going to say our target range, and I used to always say our target range, but I got to be honest, we have totally moved away from ages now. We're just like a family service. We pretty much work with youth from uh, nine years old to adults up to 70. However, we can help in any way. We've kind of, I've kind of shifted that for us to be youth and young adult to more of a family service. We haven't actually got the name change, but we're working with family period. If it's the mom, the dad, the uncle, the, the, the younger, but all ages we are able to help out with. I hope that answered it. Your question. Yes, thank okay. you. And Jessica. I also wanted to, to highlight um, that our own Demita Cravens is shifting her role uh, and moving into a position with the city which is bitter, bittersweet. Um, and I wanted to, Amita, call, Demita, call you out and, and see if you just wanted to say anything about that or say anything about your role. This does mean that Demita is transitioning off of the board because it's a conflict for her to be a staff member and a board member. Um, but, but as you guys have seen from Jeremy's presentation and Kristen's presentation, we <laughs> hope to hear from Demita in future. But, um, I don't have a lot to say, just that I'm looking forward to this new role. Uh, role. Um, although I am doing this full time, I did keep about eight of my clients. So I'm still doing private practice, working for private practice too, just so I can have somewhat of a balance. And I believe I can bring some of my skills from private practice and working at Trilogy once upon a time to helping our youth and young adults as well. Absolutely. The city is so lucky to have you in this role. 
And we will miss yes. you. Yes, uh, we are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Demita. Um, I think we're, I don't see any further questions. We'll continue through the agenda. And our next item is our community needs assessment and mental health measures, which we, did we go in reverse order on presentations? I think we, we did. Um, so just FY 2022 first quarter report updates. That's Jessica. Yes, I was going to say, in keeping in the theme of, of kind of reversing the order, I was hoping that we could um, talk about or that I could field any questions about uh, first quarter reports uh, before we go into um, community needs and assessments. Yes, absolutely. So I can intro that by saying, um, all agencies submitted first quarter reports. Uh, the information was uh, compiled in the packet uh, in terms of numbers served, hours of service, um, and referrals, uh, very much in, in following the way agencies reported um, at the end of, of 2021. Um, there are there are still some some staffing challenges. I have I have good news to report on that front and and um, so some some challenges. Uh, the hack has still not been able to um, hire a case manager either in their partnership with Trilogy or independently. Um, but all other programs are moving along, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if, if there are questions about those agencies or the, their reports. Many members, do you have any questions? So are they interviewing? Did they let you know or are they, or I know there's a shortage of course, but are they in the process of final interviews? So it's my understanding that they've done two rounds of in, in, interview interviews um, and it has not resulted in a successful hire to date. Do they have plans to sort of change or do they have a plan to be more successful in a third round? Um, a plan B maybe? <laughs> yes, thank you, Kathy. I'm like, you know. <laughs> So um, the, the HACS original proposal was to work in partnership with Trilogy. Um, I think the newer iteration is for the HACK to kind of branch out on its own and maybe, maybe hire um, directly. And so we're hopeful that that will, that will produce better results. I think it was Thresholds they were working with, was it not, not Trilogy? It was. Yeah. It was the, I'm sorry. They both start with a T. I'm sorry, but thank you. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I, I can also let the committee know that uh, Peer Services recently hired a new, not recently, uh, but in April hired a new executive director, Jennifer Kohler. Um, she's replacing Maureen McDonald. Um, YOU has hired a new case manager and a new executive director of finance. So um, that pro program did experience some challenges due to staffing loss and turnover in 2021, um, but they are trying to um, rebuild staff and move forward. Um, and then Connections has hired a new controller. Um, so, so those were the, the new hires that we, we've seen recently. I can also say that North Shore Senior Center provided information. At the last meeting, the committee members requested additional information about North Shore Senior Center's um, services, expanded services to seniors. And um, North Shore did provide uh, pages of information that I will be sending along to the committee um, in, in a later email. I did not receive those documents in time to put them in the packet. So I thought I would make an announcement to let everybody know that they've provided the additional information and that I will be sending it in a follow-up email. Perfect, thank you. Any questions from committee members beyond what we've already asked? 
All right, Jessica, we're sticking with you, correct? Yes, fantastic. Okay, well then, you know, moving right along. Um, so we have heard a lot um, about local measures and uh, initiatives from Kristen and Jeremy, and there was additional information in the packet about um, efforts from um, other community stakeholders, including um, North Shore, excuse me, um, North Shore University Health Systems. Um, even though the information provided in the memo was from their um, 2019 uh, community needs assessment, we have heard that their most recent assessment, much like our e-plan, is in draft form, but should be released in June. Um, Kristen was able to confirm that a lot of the information is similar um, and the, their process for gathering information in terms of community outreach um, was very similar. So we look forward to seeing um, their, their two initiatives for youth, um, which is their Bridges program and the um, clinic at ETHS uh, to see if those services are maintained in in, in future or if, if they're expanded. So I hope to have an update in June or July or whenever their, their finalized report is released. Um, but really what we hope to talk to the committee about is uh, this, this pool of money that we have for support services and really looking at how we'd like to apply these funds. Um, Staff has, has sort of two proposals, um, individual counseling uh, and, and group counseling. Um, if group counseling is the option, we would also like to hear from the committee about potentially narrowing um, the, the, the service range. Um, would, we, would we want to see if we could focus uh, or hold group counseling sessions for youth or adults? Um, do we wanna pick special populations within those groups? Um, these are just suggestions. We wanted to have the conversation with the committee, um, but depending on, on how the committee feels, staff is certainly happy to come back with some very concrete next steps um, at, our, at our upcoming meeting with, with the committee's blessing. Jessica, do you have a sense of the needs, I mean, of, of adults versus kids? I mean, is there an understanding of, uh, my first assumption is, is perhaps there are some services for children that are at schools that don't, you know, but obviously we also hear so much about youth pressure. I mean, do we have a sense um, of the largest unmet need? Well, I don't know about the largest unmet need. When we when we held uh, conversations um, with the working group, Demita and Amanda, with our case management service providers, we did hear uh, that uh, group counseling for parents or particularly younger parents um, would be an important population to look at. Um, justice involved youth uh, also stood out as a population that that is very underserved um, in, within a population that's underserved. So, you know, these are, these are the challenges. I think those were the, not I think, those were the two groups that emerged as- Those two populations underserved. are very logical. I mean, a lot of barriers, a lot of pressure, um, yep. you know, yeah. And I'm sorry, I. I I almost neglected to mention because I don't, I think that it's been mentioned so often, but it, it should be mentioned that within those groups, um, a, a focus on our Black and Hispanic youth uh, is a particular need and, and finding services that are culturally sensitive, um, services for our LEP, our, um, uh, or I'm sorry, ELP, our Eng English, uh, English language uh, learners. Thank you. English language learners <clears throat> and, and our immigrant populations. Um, there's a tremendous need there. So,
I mean, that to me, I'll, I'll pause and see if anybody um, from the com further from the committee um, has any further thoughts, but I think that aligns a lot with our, what we've been discussing. Kathy, thank you. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> um, I guess I have some, I need some clarification and maybe just you can give me that. $200,000, as we all have stated, is not a lot of money. If you're talking about an individual therapist, that's just one whole therapist. The need for black and brown children to be able to have therapy in conjunction with their families and possibly bilingual, are we talking about networking with organizations already in existence so we don't have to eat up that money with uh, Capital old, capital line issues and overhead. That's a great question. Um, we are in tentative conversations with um, a, a number of community partners. Um, what we are hearing initially is um, if those community partners were to either hire additional staff or if possible, carve out space among existing staff to take on um, more clientele. And that is the, the more challenging option. Um, those partners would really be looking for a commitment that extends beyond one year. We're looking at like a two year or more commitment so that if our partners were to hire additional staff to, to meet the demand, um, th that they could guarantee. They, they don't want to have to let someone go exactly. after they just, I mean, right. it, it's an investment to hire somebody. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But what we were, Kathy, to your question, one of the things that we see as an opportunity to expand existing programs, I mean, you know, with existing providers, I should say. So if, if we, gave somebody money to hire an additional um, therapist, you know, they, it's not like we're going to have that person sit there and wait and just take only the people who are referred from our case management, for example. So what we have to be able to, but then we would want to work out of flexibility so that we sort of, for lack of a better way, feel that we have a certain number of slots of people who we're referring that will get services. And I think that's the thing we need to try to work out because, um, we are trying to expand services specifically for our case management clients. So it was a kind of like, eh, and, um, and when in our discussions of group sessions, um, we see an opportunity to um, expand those beyond probably just our case management clients, because that's going to be more effective and get the groups you need, because we may not be able to put together the, you know, right number of people for a group, like at the right time, you know, I, th I think you all understand because many of you are practitioners yourself. It, it's just not an easy thing to, it's just not, it doesn't go poof. Everything's ready and starts right. up exactly when people need help. So it's how to figure out how to get ongoing ability to work with providers um, to, so that we have a, that's the part of the long-term relationship too. And I think that that's the whole theory of our case management and these services and, and, and focusing on um, our funding on the people with greatest needs so that we actually make progress over time. But, you know, it is, we're still in the early stages of quite a change from our prior systems of just funding programs every year and saying, oh, this one's good, let's give them this much. So we just, um, you know, as Jessica said, we wanna make sure that, um, we would be likely coming back with a recommendation for, you know, a multi-year agreement, of course, always based on funding and things like that, but, but it's just critical to be able to, to move that forward. Thank you, Sierra. Amanda. Thanks. Um, I, going back to your original question, Jessica, I think I would sort of put a plug in for leaving the population sort of open so that there could there could be opportunities for adults and children and I think um, you know based on the report from Kristen just seeing how prevalent alcohol use disorders are or issues are related to that as well as mood disorders plus you know Jeremy's report about 
um, the youth services and just enhancing those. I think, I think um, leaving it open would be great. Also, that kind of gets at Sarah's thing. Like if, I think just more flexibility might be nice. And I know it's not a ton of money, but um, I think I would, if I could say, I would vote for kind of leaving it more open. Does leaving it open create challenges with the therapists they find? You know, I, I don't know that it creates challenges um, with the therapists that we find. Um, it, and it actually does give staff more flexibility um, to, to work with partners and to hear what they might have available <laughs> as opposed to coming out with a strong position uh, with very defined parameters and, and hoping we find that needle in a haystack. Um, Perfect. Yes, my, my goal is just that, you know, for the committee to be happy with what, it, with what we present <laughs> once we're ready to do so. So just, you know. we did have some discussions with Oak Park because of course they've, they're doing similar sorts of things and it was really interesting um, the Oak Park um, Mental Health Board is really, they said, well, you know what, we're basically at this point just providing support to our mental health providers. And then we explained our case management and trying to get direct service. I said, oh, now I see why you're looking at, because we wanted to talk to them about, they'd done both fee-for-service agreements and they'd done um, um, grants to organizations that would provide certain services. And so we were trying to get feedback on that. But it was really interesting because one of the big challenges is we just don't know the capacity of our, our potential providers too. So I appreciate if we have some flexibility because we don't really know what we're going to be able to come up with. I think we know what we need to try to get, but you know, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging for everybody right now. Um, and so... But I guess the thing is, um, I, I guess the thing I'm most interested in, um, do you think we should do, would you like to see us pursue both group sessions and individual counseling? Because that could really um, kind of determine a focus differently. Kathy? The concept, as Amanda had already said, the flexibility, um, because once you have a child that comes into the room, eventually you're going to have to deal with the mother, the father, the auntie, the grandma, the grandpa, or whomever. I mean, that's just a reality and the treatment for it to be sustainable and successful. So I'm not really saying individual. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get as much bang out the buck as we can get. <laughs> and, and, and at the same time, being flexible enough to, to have uh, families have what are what most would call wraparound services or just services that make a difference is what I call it. So I, I'm really not stuck on individual or, or group. If the group is the family, I'll take it. <laughs> well, and if I could say that's an excellent point. One of the um, challenges that, that uh, representatives from the Moran Center brought up is that they could be providing counseling services to the individual they're working with, um, but, but given the nature of those services and given the nature of the individual's needs, um, if family counseling were the best option and something that the family was open to, that is not a service Moran Center could provide because of the specialized nature of their relationship with the individual. Um, so I think if, if if we do have families who are open to family counseling, um, that would go a long way toward improving uh, mental health and improving outcomes. Thank you. Amanda? Um, yeah, I'm in support of the flexibility also, but I also just want to say that I am very pleased that group is being so strongly considered because I think given the isolation and loneliness and how that drives 
mental health concerns, um, not to mention everything with the pandemic, I do think that it's a fantastic modality to really address those things and, and learn you know, from others and that kind of capacity. So, you know, whether it's group or individual, whatever kind of fits, but I am really happy that group is on the docket. Absolutely. And I think, Amanda, to especially um, for those like adolescent age and, and as they're navigating how to communicate and recognize that they're not, um, that these challenges are not necessarily unique to them. It's so critical. Mm -hmm. Archa. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of going with what Kathy said. I think getting bang, more bang for the buck um, would be and going with the group therapy and maybe having some kind of like workflows that, okay, this person needs a little bit more attention. Where would we guide them to just having some kind of referrals for family therapy or individual therapy, guiding them? I think through group therapy, we can offer better navigation throughout the system. And, you know, just the social aspect would be definitely a big positive, getting more kids involved or more parents, adults, any kind of like group support therapy would be beneficial. Well, one of the things that we have funded historically that was very valued that we're not was the parenting uh, program of Metropolitan Family Services, and they, because of their merger, didn't apply for funding and things like that. And and I think that was part of what that um, program did. So I, I I think that's a helpful comment that you know you you find you get them started, and then some of them may need to go into different individual therapy. But it it maybe I. I will be the first to admit I'm not a practitioner, but it, it may be a way to get people into, because it's not quite as um, scary for them to maybe even admitting that you might need help is sometimes hard. It's easier to get together in a group sometimes. So, yeah. Wonderful, it's really wonderful insights and discussion. Committee members, anybody else have any additions? If I recall, as I pivot back, I believe that is now time for our second public comment. Yes. Did we receive any indication that there would be? We do. We have um, Allie Harnett has raised her hand. Wonderful, Allie. Mm -hmm. Hi, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Am I there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so, love this discussion and um my, is my camera not on i don't know how to turn it on it's so, not on anyway. <laughs> okay it's probably it's probably for the better it's been a long day and i'm outside at a pizza place in skokie um but i have loved this discussion and it sounds like we're talking a lot about wraparound services which some people on the call know is like my obsession um and i wanted to let people on this committee know that um the Mental Health Task Force has been talking about wraparound and we have one of the subcommittees now committed is like focused on wraparound. And we have a meeting on Monday at 10 a.m. where we're gonna have a representative from Milwaukee Wraparound, which is a longstanding um, organization, been around for like 20 some years. And they have um, a funding model that, that uses like funding from various sources. Um, and uh, they have mental health services for families um, that are at risk of being in the juvenile justice system or at risk of um, outplacement in DCFS or in um, having um, challenges in schools. Anyway, if anybody on the committee would be interested in attending the meeting at 10 a.m. on Monday and learning more about Milwaukee Wraparound and kind of seeing how we might be able to apply it in Evanston is obviously the goal, um, let me know and I would be happy to invite you to that Zoom meeting. Ali, if you could send the in meeting information to me, I would be happy to send it out to everyone on the Great. committee. I could do that. I'm sure I have your email. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, if not, you have mine, Ali. <laughs> yes, for sure, I do. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ali, for the invitation and for pulling that together. Any other public comment? And with that, I believe 
we can adjourn tonight's meeting. All right, thank you guys, everyone, for this uh, thorough discussion and your engagement. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Congratulations, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, congratulations, congratulations to Mita. Well, we've got her closer now. We can ask yes. her even more questions. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Congratulations, Tamita. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thank you. Bye, guys.